So this video is going to cover Dr. Sawyer's study tips to help you do better in your anatomy and physiology courses. And this material can also apply to other courses as well. So in this video, we are going to cover how we learn, and then we're going to talk about specific changes in the brain when we discuss memory and neurons, which are nerve cells. We're going to discuss the importance of sleep, how multitasking doesn't work, and then I'll finish with some effective study tips and habits that are more applicable to this specific course. So I am going to start out with one of my favorite quotes of all time, and it says, the capacity to learn is a gift, the ability to learn is a skill, the willingness to learn is a choice. And this comes from Dune by Frank Herbert, which is a great series of books that have also been adapted for the big screen. So the first line, the capacity to learn is a gift. We are all born with a capacity to learn. The human brain is a marvelous organ that gives us all this amazing capacity to continue to learn new information throughout our lives. But now notice the second line. The ability to learn is a skill. And so like any skill, you can practice and make it better and learn new ways of refining it and making it even more efficient. So the focus of this PowerPoint is to give you some tools that can help you approve, improve your ability to learn. And then also notice the last line, the willingness to learn is a choice. So all of the study help in the world isn't going to help you until you also make the choice that you want to learn new material. So you have to have that willingness to learn um, that plays an important role as well. So in this first section, we are going to talk about how we actually learn new material. So I like to call this the art of learning. And so remember the letters A-R-T. The A stands for acquiring new material. This happens th through sensory input. So your eyes, your ears, and even doing things physically. But most importantly in school, it's usually uh, the sensory input involves reading new material or listening to lectures. And so this is the acquiring new material. The next stage is the R, which is to retain the new material. And so the material that you're learning goes into your short-term memory. So this is the stage at which it becomes a short-term retention of the material, but there is still a potential for it to be lost. And then the T stands for transfer new material. And this is where you transfer the memories from short term to long term. And this is the type of memory and learning that you want when it comes time for your exams and you need to recall the information. And then also for your future careers when you might also need the information. So sensory input is when you acquire the material and that makes sense to a lot of people and then retaining and putting the, mem the uh, information into short-term memory also makes sense. But a lot of people are like, well, what do you mean transfer? How do you transfer from short-term to long-term memory? So there are several techniques that can help you with this final step and some, some uh, simple ways to practice transferring the information. Number one is repetition, going over the material more than one time re-listening to lectures, rereading textbook chapters, basically just repeating the material in multiple ways. Also connecting new information to old information. So rather than trying to form brand new memories in your brain that are completely disconnected from other stuff in your brain, you try to actually connect the new information to old information and that actually makes the memory stronger. And you can do this by creating analogies. And I'm going to give you an example of an analogy a little bit later. You can also use the new information to solve problems. So depending on your course, you could look at case studies. You could do in-class activities and worksheets. 
Uh, you could do different types of uh, homework assignments, right? Anything that requires you to take what you just learned and use it to answer questions and solve problems. Also practice being able to explain the new information to other people. So you really find out whether you know something or not in a deep manner if you're able to explain it to someone else. So to practice this, you could form a study group with other students in your course. You could also hold D, uh, D2L discussions in the discussion boards. Uh, you could talk to your friends and family. Just practice explaining the information to other people and this actually helps cement it into your long-term memory. You can also do self-testing. This is when you make up your own test questions. So instead of just relying on test questions that you find like at the end of the textbook chapter or that your uh, professor gives you on quizzes or exams, you can like make up your own questions. You'll find very quickly that unless you have really learned the material deep at a deep level, it's very hard to write your own uh, test question. Also, you can practice rewriting key concepts in your own words. So rather than regurgitating it back word for word like it is in a lecture or in the textbook chapter, see if you can write out the concept in your own words, kind of like in a journal style. In this section, we're going to look at actually how memories are formed and stored in the brain by the connections made between your nerve cells, which are called neurons. So this is something that you will learn or did learn in AMP1. So if you're an AMP1 student now, you're going to learn this later this semester. If you're an AMP2 student now, this is something you should have learned last semester. So neurons that fire together wire together. So we have two neurons, which are also called nerve cells. And we have a pink one on the left and a green one on the right. And so the area where the two neurons talk to each other is called a synapse. So a synapse is a structure that allows a neuron to pass a signal to another neuron or another cell in the body like a muscle cell or a gland, etc. So we have these two neurons in the brain and memories are actually specific connections between individual neurons. These are called memory engrams. And so, for example, something else that you will learn or did learn in AMP1 is that the alacranon is a structure on the bone called the ulna. And so as part of forming this memory, you like have a neuron that remembers or codes the information for alacranon and a neuron that remembers or codes the information for ulna. And so you have a connection between these two that helps you remember that the alacranon is part of the ulna. And so again, the connection between these two is called a synapse. But in the very beginning, when you first learn this information, this synapse is very small. There's an only one connection between these two neurons. And so this is what we would call a weak link. The two neurons are not very tightly or strongly tied to each other. So you have the capacity to forget this information. At this point, this information is still in the short term memory. You have acquired it, but it's still stuck in that short term. So what happens when you study and when you f uh, have really good study habits and follow study tips like I'm going to go over later in this uh, lecture, then what actually happens is these synapses, these connections between the one neuron and the next neuron actually get stronger. So you can see the synapse got larger here. So you'll learn or did learn that this involves uh, increased neurotransmitter release or increased receptors on the other side. So basically this synapse got stronger. Then you continue studying the material. Again, you're repeating the material. You're practicing the ways to transfer the material. Now you're actually going to develop multiple synapses between these two neurons. So now we have an increase in the number of synapses. And again, you continue to study, uh, you continue to repeat the material. Now you're going to have this one neuron in pink is going to grow a new extension called an axon collateral. And it's going to connect with a new dendrite that grows on the green neuron. So now we actually have even more connections between these two neurons. And now we are looking at a strong memory that is in our long-term memory. 
right? And so this means that this information is now going to be easy to recall and it's going to stay with us for a long time. And here is another slide to just emphasize again the strengthening of the synapses. So what we have in this picture, this is a close-up look at some of the spines on dendrites. So again, something that you learned or will learn in AMP1 is that the dendrites of neurons have these little extensions called spines. And so when you learn something, which is shown in the second picture, you actually get rewiring of these circuits. So some of your spines disappear, you grow spines in other locations. But again, this is a temporary stage. And it's not until you repeat the information multiple times and you study it uh, diligently over a period of time that it becomes a long-term memory in which those synapses become stabilized and you no longer have the um, a chance that you're going to lose them. So take home message, you are literally changing your brain when you study. So the brain that you have after you're done with a study session is different than the brain you had before you started. This does require time and repetition. Last minute cramming will not allow this process to happen and will not help you make long term memories. So here is another little example I like to use. So this is actually showing uh, the growth of neurons and connections between those neurons as you grow and develop from a child to an adult. And again, this is also a type of learning because as you grow from a newborn to an adult, you are undergoing a period of immense learning in your life. You're learning to walk, you're learning to talk, you're going to school, you're learning you know, basic arithmetic, how to read. So there's lots of learning going on in this period. And so you can see how when you start out, there's not that many connections between the neurons in your brain. And then as an adult, you have all of these very detailed and strong connections between the different neurons. And so again, this kind of shows um, sort of exaggerated, but it shows the same process that takes place when you actually repeatedly study material so that this could be an example of like you know a student who crams right before an exam or has ineffective study habits maybe they don't have so many connections between their neurons and their memories are not very strongly formed whereas a student who studies hard and effectively all semester will have these nice strong connections between their different neurons so i mentioned earlier that one of the ways to really transfer or help to move that memory from short term to long term is to make analogies. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to use an analogy for learning that can help you show number one, how to create an analogy and number two, how that analogy can help you remember the material. So let's think about a dirt road. So a dirt road is hard to travel. If you do drive along it, you have to go slow. There's not much traffic. You could drive for a long time without seeing another car. And then now let's compare that to a paved road, which is easier to travel. You still have some issues. You might have a lot of potholes. There might be a rough surface. And you have limited traffic on this road because, again, there is only uh, the two lanes. Then you have highways, which are easier still. You can go faster that can carry more traffic. And then at the very top of the list, we have interstates, which can carry a lot of traffic. You can go your fastest speeds and you have your more direct routes from point A to point B. So think about this in terms of the neurons, right? So think about the nerve cells in your brain when you first make a memory, right? That would be your dirt road. So it's hard to travel, the information is going slow, you're not getting much traffic between those two neurons. After you have studied a little and you strengthen that synapse, now you have a paved road, the information can travel a little bit easier. You do still have some issues and you're not getting as much traffic between those neurons. Then you have a highway. This would be an even stronger connection between those two neurons. So maybe now we have more synapses. 
Um, so this is easier still. The information can flow faster. We can have more information traveling over that connection. And then after you studied a lot and you have that information firmly tucked into your long-term memory, this is like an interstate between those two neurons. We have all sorts of synaptic connections. We can carry a lot of traffic. The, the, we can go at our fastest speeds. And it's a more direct route. So when we want to recall the information, it's very easy to get that information uh, back up into our brain. So when it's time to take an exam, what do you want your neurons to be like? Do you want it to be like a dirt road? Or do you want it to be like an interstate? You should want it to be like an interstate. And so just to carry that analogy another step, so again, if we look at a picture like this, where on the left we have uh, neurons that don't have very many connections, again, this would be like our dirt road. Then as we get more uh, connections between our neurons, this would be like our paved road. As we're getting even more, this would be our highway. And then when we have this lovely little uh, complicated branching mess over here, this would be our interstate. So again, where do you want to be at exam time? At exam time, you want to have these really strong connections between your neurons so that it is very easy to recall the information that you need to know. And then many of you are planning on having a career in the health sciences. A lot of you are planning on going to dental hygiene school or nursing school or maybe even medical school or to pharmacy school. And you want, you not only want, you need to know this information in these future courses and in your future careers. And so you really want to have these long-term memories. You really want this interstate of, of networking between the neurons in order to be able to pull from that uh, information that you learned in A and P. And so the take home message is that in order to get the information from short term memory into long term memory, you need to have repetition, repetition, and repetition. Hopefully using different methods to transfer the information, but still interacting with the information in multiple ways, multiple times. So in this section, I'm going to go over how important sleep is for this process of strengthening connections between your nerve cells. So sleep is 100% absolutely required for the formation of long-term memories. So those synaptic changes that I mentioned earlier that take place between the neurons in your brain happen while you sleep. So if you don't sleep or don't get enough sleep, you literally are not getting those stronger connections no matter how much you repeat the material or practice transferring it. So reduced sleep equals reduced synaptic strengthening. So bottom take home message, bottom line, you need sleep as the second major part of this process for forming long-term memories. So staying up late studying or cramming is actually less effective in the long run than getting enough sleep. So if we take our little diagram from earlier where I said repetition, 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 and we're going to modify it now, we're going to say you need to repeat the material, then sleep, repeat the material, then sleep, repeat the material, then sleep, and that is how you form these very strong long-term memories. So don't just take my word for it. There are lots of studies that show that the less college students sleep, the worse their grades are. So like every lost hour of average nightly sleep at the start of an academic term can predict a 0.07 point drop in a student's GPA. Sleep, especially undisturbed sleep, helps the brain process and retain information it has learned. And when someone is sleep deprived, Attention, span, and memory are impaired. Study better sleep habits lead to better college grades. Data on MIT students underscore the importance of getting enough sleep. Bedtime also matters. Successful students tend to sleep more. Many students give up sleep to get good grades, but research shows that the students who sleep more get better grades. So it's not just me telling you this, there is a lot of research that shows you have to have sleep in order to form those long-term memories. Lack of sleep has additional consequences as well. So when we are overly tired or exhausted, 
the neurons in our hippocampus are not functioning normally even while we are awake. And the hip hippocampus is part of the area of your brain that is responsible for making the memories. Poor sleep impacts cognitive function in both the short term and the long term. So short term sleep deprivation, so like just staying up late one night, can still lead to a difficulty in concentrating, a decline in mood, impaired memory, and then of course visible signs of fatigue. And then long term sleep deprivation, so not getting enough sleep over a period of several days, or weeks, months, results in poor work performance, a cognitive decline, and yes, New research has shown it also leads to a heightened risk of dementia. So that's also important to keep in mind. So some tips. A lot of students say, well, I just have trouble falling asleep. So uh, look at different types of relaxation techniques that can help you fall asleep. For example, like meditation at bedtime. Stop using devices like your phone and your TV 30 minutes before bedtime. Uh, the blue light that is emitted by devices actually suppresses the hormones in your brain that help you sleep. Take naps as necessary to make up for missed sleep. And avoid caffeine later in the afternoon and evening, because if you do take in caffeine later in the afternoon and evening, that can help you uh, not, or it can keep you from falling asleep, and it can also give you a poor quality of sleep. A few more tips in terms of uh, getting the best out of your brain. Exercise can also improve new synapse formation and strengthening between your neurons. Drink plenty of water. Even a very mild dehydration can decrease your cognitive ability by 10%. And stick to water and reduce the consumption of energy drinks and soda. The caffeine and sugar in those drinks bring their own host of problems. Complex carbohydrates like whole grains, vegetables, and fruit are better for your brain function than simple carbs like bread, pasta, and rice. Those uh, result in a blood sugar spike that then quickly uh, falls and it leaves your brain starved for energy. Meditation can increase the brain's ability to process information. There's been a lot of uh, research on that recently. And then take breaks when you're studying. Your neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that allow one neuron to talk to another neuron, can become depleted over time. So a one-hour study session, you know, if you're trying to study straight for eight hours, eventually your brain is actually not forming any new synapses because it's fatigued and you're running low on your neurotransmitters. So you would be best to have multiple one-hour study sessions throughout the week. Not only are you not fatiguing your brain, doing that, but you're also allowing yourself to sleep in between those study sessions. In this section, we're going to talk about multitasking. Everyone thinks they can multitask, but the research shows that it does not work. So multitasking, everyone thinks they can, but no one really can. So here's a quote by a cognitive neuroscience from UC Berkeley. It says, multitasking is a myth. In reality, it's rapidly switching from one task to another and then back again. And every time you make that switch, you pay a tax on both your time and your energy. For that reason, it's almost always more efficient to monotask. Focus on one thing and move on when you're done so you don't pay unnecessary switching taxes. So when you do try to do more than one thing at a time, your brain is actually rapidly switching from task to task. It's giving its full attention to each task. So when you think you're going back and forth efficiently, you're really taking your brain, making it switch gears and focus on the new task, which as uh, Dr. Youssef put it, you're paying a tax in terms of time and energy. And then once you're focused on the new ta task and then you switch back to the old task, again, your brain has to stop and reset to focus on the uh, old task again. So you're actually paying a cost in terms of time and energy every time you make that switch. So you're not giving either task your full attention and there is a cost every time you make a switch. And due to the costs, it can actually take more time to try to do two things simultaneously than to finish one before starting the other. 
So it actually ends up in the end to be much less productive to try to multitask. So time management is a big issue with students. A lot of students are like, I just don't have time to do everything I need to do for all of my courses. Well, I want you to consider how many times you try to multitask while you study, like you study, you check your emails, you check your phone, you talk to your friends, you try to eat. Think about how many times you try to do all of that. You're actually costing yourself more time by doing that than if you would just focus on one thing at a time. And then there is also this thing called attention residue. When you switch to a new task rapidly, you actually could still be thinking about the previous task, even in your subconscious, which actually reduces your attention and focus on the task that you switched to. And studies have also shown that it's bad for mental health. There have been some recent studies that show that people who have burnouts are also those who try to multitask everything. So how to avoid these pitfalls? Set aside a study period. Turn your phone on silent and don't check text messages. Maybe have a do not disturb period on your phone where only close friends and family can get through in the case of an emergency, but everything else is blocked. Also avoid checking emails during this period. Focus just on the studying during your study period. Also study one subject at a time. Don't try to rapidly switch back and forth between subjects. You can create a study schedule for yourself at the beginning of the semester. Example, you could say on Mondays from 1 to 2 p.m. I'm going to study chemistry. On Mondays from 4 to 5.30 p.m. I'm going to study anatomy and physiology, etc. Map out your entire week. You can even share this with your friends and family so they don't try to bother you with text or emails during these periods. You can be like, this is my study period every week and stick to it. And as this uh, quote down here says, multitasking is a scam. In this section, I'm going to go over some effective study tips and study habits and give you a guide on how to do best in this course. So again, let's remember two key terms. Let's remember that we need repetition, repetition, and repetition in order to get stuff into long-term memory. And we want sleep between each bout of repetition. And we also want to remember the term engagement. So we acquire the information we're learning through sensory input. It then gets retained into our short-term memory. The engagement part comes in with that transfer to long-term memory. This is when we are doing things like trying to create analogies, trying to explain concepts to our friends and family, trying to put things into our own words, trying to use the information to solve new problems, etc. So we need the repetition and sleep, and we need the engagement. These are the two cornerstones of successful learning. And then remember to practice the transfer of the material. So I'm going to give you an example way to study for your A and P course this semester. And then you would follow this example uh, path that I'm about to show you, and you would repeat it for every chapter throughout the semester. So for your first study session, you would listen to the lecture PowerPoint. You would take notes. You would connect your notes to the learning objectives. And you could write a final summary in your own words of what you learned while listening to the lecture video. Then for your second study session, you could review the learning objectives, try to explain those objectives to someone else, try to create analogies with the material you've learned, and then start on your Mastering a and homework. And I want to note that I expect, um, when I'm talking about these different study sessions, I'm including that you would have sleep in between each one. So this is doing the repetition plus sleep, and then these different uh, suggestions in the boxes are to transfer or engage with the material. So study session three, you would use the in-class worksheet that I will post for every chapter. You will try to answer the questions on your own first. Then you will watch my activity video, which will go over the answers. Then you will connect what you learned in that learning activity with the learning objectives. Then in your fourth study session, you're going to review all of your materials. Maybe now you try to make up your own test questions and answer them. You're also still explaining concepts to others to see how well you've retained the information. 
And then in your final study session, you do one more review and then you take the D2L quiz. And so this is an example of uh, spending five days with sleep in between on each chapter. Now note that different strategies work for different people. So you may have to experiment to find out what works for you. Just keep in mind as you develop your study habits and your study schedule that you need to somehow incorporate both repetition with sleep in between and engagement. So it also helps to establish good study habits. Keep up with the material. This is an online course. And so it is on you to keep up with the material and to try to get ahead when you can and not fall behind. So again, try to get ahead when you can. Procrastination is not your friend when it comes to studying and learning because when you procrastinate and wait until the last day or two before something is due, you no longer have that opportunity to do the repetition, repetition, repetition with the sleep in between. So this is uh, me over here and this is procrastination. And procrastination is saying, you see that Woody? It's your GPA, kiss it goodbye. So when you procrastinate, you cheat yourself out of the time necessary to form those long-term memories, which, mean you aren't, which means you aren't going to do as good on the exams, which means you're not going to end up with the grade you want. It also helps to review the material before bed. This helps with that strengthening of the synapses between your nerve cells. So if you find yourself dreaming about A and P, then you're doing it right. So actually when we dream, uh, that is the period at which our synapses are strengthening. And so if you're dreaming about A and P, that is actually telling you that it's those A and P memories that are getting strengthened that night while you were dreaming about A and P. Try to study a little every day or at least five days a week. Shorter study sessions with sleep in between is better than one or two long sessions because the one or two long sessions are going to tire out your brain, give you neurotransmitter fatigue, and not allow you enough sleep time between to allow for the strengthening of the synapses. Approach the information in different ways. This goes back to creating analogies, trying to write things in your own words, trying to explain concepts to other people, um, just trying to see things from a new angle. And then practice memorization skills. Memorization is a skill, like all of learning is, and so you can get better at it with practice um, and just sticking with it. And then seek assistance when needed. If you have a question, um, please come and see me during my office hours or email me for an appointment outside of my office hours. Um, there's also tutoring services offered by the university. Um, there's multiple ways that you can get assistance, but please seek it when you need it. It also really helps if you can find a study partner or a study group because this will help you with that uh, part of learning where you try to explain th something to someone else. That helps you uh, realize whether or not you have a good grasp on the material is if you can explain it to someone else. And that is it for the A&P Study Help video. You've got this, you can do it, and just remember, education is something that other people do to you. Learning is something you do for yourself.